I am going to let Alan Rich, our solar system ambassador from NASA and JPL, take it away and share all the cool stuff about Mars Rover. Yeah, I figure out how to do it. <laughs> That's okay. You got <laughs> That's always a problem with me. Here we go. Um, I'm pushing a button. There's that. I see it. You can see it. Well, now I need to make it uh, go all slideshowy. And there we go. Yay. Can you see it? Yeah, it, it looks great now. Okay, let's get going. Uh, we're going to talk today about the NASA's biggest and smartest robot that has ever been built on its way to Mars right now. And don't forget, February 18th, get with the museum. The museum's doing something like this. We're having a landing show. The seven minutes of terror when the crazy wild landing of the of this new uh, robot happens. That's just about three weeks from now. So uh, join us again in three weeks. Uh, the Mars Perseverance robot, like most of our spacecraft, are made and designed and managed at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, just up the hill from Los Angeles. It's, uh, Cal it's part of the California Institute of Technology. This is the entrance, and this is the, uh, gu the guard at the entrance. He's, uh, as you can tell, he's only got one leg. Um, he, um, he used to not have any arms and legs, but he, he got better. So nobody dares breach our security. So Perseverance, the Mars robot, the robot formerly known as Mars 2020 before somebody like you uh, got to name it. And the name Perseverance was picked. It's an artist picture of it. It's about the size of a big car and it's going to Mars. And this is an actual picture of Mars, high definition picture of Mars. It looks like tree stumps in the foreground though, but uh, hmm, maybe we ought to go there and see what those are. It's a beautiful picture. So Mars is kind of a cool place. It looks like a someplace in the desert here. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically where we're going, look at this picture. It's a Jezero crater. It used to be an ancient river or a small sea. And you can actually see up on the top left of this picture where the riverbed that fed this lake or small sea fed into it, at how the water is carved out and then the river delta into the ancient lake. So this place where Perseverance is landing, it's got huge steep cliffs, it's got fields of boulders, and you know, we don't know how they got there, and sand dunes, and hopefully the thing we're really looking for is evidence of past, or even present, life on Mars. So it's a really cool place. Big process deciding where to land robots on Mars. And this is, I think, a really good idea. Mars is different today. Mars used to be a lot more like Earth. It used to be warmer, have a thicker atmosphere, a lot of water. It's different. And one of the things we want to know is why did it change and get kind of not very nice like it is now. Um, so the Perseverance is going to study Mars for its uh, habitability for life, both in ancient times, millions or billions of years ago, and possibly currently. It's going to look for signs of ancient life, even though there's no, it won't really directly look for life unless it, ha it has its camera pointed someplace and something walks in front of it. That would be awesome. But unless that happens, we're not specifically looking directly for something that's alive, just that it could be, or it could have been, or evidence that it had been there. Like there's some chemicals that, like sugars or proteins or things that if you find something like that, I mean, there's chemicals, organic chemicals like methane and ammonia, ammonia is not organic, but there's chemicals that you can find on planets that are totally dead, like uh, probably Saturn's moon Titan, full of all kinds of chemicals, organic chemicals and everything, but they can be there without anything living and dying and turning into oil or you know how things, evidence of life happens here on earth. But, there are certain chemicals, the complicated ones like proteins, that if you find that, that means that something was alive there and had to make that. It couldn't just happen just on a planet that doesn't have life on it. Another other cool things we're doing, we're gathering samples, uh, Mars dirt samples, for later missions to come and bring back to Earth. And we're testing the technology, uh, future technologies, like making oxygen for astronauts to breathe, making water, 
um, and flying helicopters. This Mars uh, Perseverance robot has a helicopter on it. The first time that we've ever put a helicopter anywhere besides on Earth. I got pictures of that. I'll show you more about that. Um, it has, here's the robot being built in Pasadena. It has some instruments on it. Uh, mass, it's, its head is up at the top left of the picture and it's got uh, some things, a mast cam, that's a camera, a super cam, it's, uh, a, it's a laser, it's got a laser zapper on it that can zap rocks and things with laser and uh, you can analyze the smoke that comes up from that and kind of tell what it's made out of. It's got a thing called Pixel, which is a spectrometer. It analyzes chemicals on Mars. It's got a thing called Sherlock. NASA invented the acronym anyway, you know. <laughs> it's, it's patented, it's a NASA patent acronym things. Um, Sherlock is another spectrometer with a microscopic camera. MOXIE, uh, that's a, uh, a thing, an experiment to be able to make oxygen out of the carbon dioxide in Mars atmosphere. Oxygen is necessary for making rocket fuel, for breathing air for astronauts, for fuel cells. If we figure out how to make oxygen on Mars, that's a big step towards uh, having people there. Uh, MEDA is uh, basically a weather station. And RIMFAX is a radar imager that's a ground penetrating radar to see what's under the ground. And it's got about 23 cameras on it and a helicopter, it's real cool. Another picture of it, uh, close up, the thing on the top left here, uh, this is a nuclear powered robot. The, uh, the two, Spirit and Opportunity, before the similar one to this, Curiosity, were solar powered. But this one is so big and needs so much energy that solar power just wouldn't cut it. So we put a nuclear power source on it. I'm gonna show you a real cool picture of that, some things about that later. Okay, I said it was the size of a car. It's three by two and a half meters size. That's about 10 feet by nine feet. It weighs 1,025 kilograms. That's 2,260 pounds. And it's uh, a full 126 or 278 pounds heavier than its very similar Curiosity robot that's on Mars right now. Here's an artist conception. This is a real picture of Mars with an artist conception of the, Curi of the uh, Perseverance robot kind of photoshopped on top of it. We do that a lot, Photoshop things. Use real pictures of one thing and put something else on it. And okay. actually, Alan, if you don't mind, um, let's see. Lenny, I believe, had a, one of our friends had a great question about that. Um, do they make models first and, and pictures and stuff to help them test test out the, the rover? Did they build the model before? A model? Mm -hmm. Did they build a model of it before they did the actual build? And how many tests did they do? Oh yeah, actually that's, oh yeah, that's a real good question. Not only do they build a model, they build an exact duplicate. And I've got a picture of Curiosity's exact duplicate here. They build a, a, a complete exact duplicate and test that in the Mars yard. Um, a long time before they ever launched the real one and there are changes made to the real ones uh, from its, uh, the test one. You, you really, you don't want to, I'll, I'll get slides on that, the Mars test yard, how to train a robot and how to uh, test how it will drive over Martian terrain. Uh, mm -hmm. Real good question. And I've got a couple slides that, that hopefully will answer that in detail coming up. Awesome. So, uh, let's go back to a little history of us sending robots, of NASA JPL sending robots to Mars. Uh, way back in 1977, the Sojourner robot and Pathfinder mission, um, it had a landing craft on the bottom left of the picture. And you can see the little guy up there at the top right of the picture crashing into a rock. Yeah, and you can see his tracks. Look at his tracks. He came down the, the ramp and then he whoop, 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 did a little donut and then went forward towards the rock and then whoop, 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 did a little donut again and went up and crashed into the rock. Um, that's a little guy, about the size of a microwave oven, the Sojourner. And here's some generations of robots. Down on the bottom left is a Sojourner that I showed you a real picture of, really on Mars. And behind him is the Spirit and Opportunity, um, which is about golf cart size. And then on the right, that's Curiosity. And it's almost the same. I told you the dimensions a minute ago. It's almost the same size and, and shape and look and everything of Perseverance. And in the middle there is uh, Doug for scale. 
and he's probably not a robot, although when he talks, his mouth doesn't move. And when you ask him if he wants to go have lunch, he says, uh, I do not eat food. So he, uh, Doug might even be a robot. It's JPL. Here's two more uh, human robots and uh, the Curiosity Perseverance size robot on the right. And this is in the Mars yard in Pasadena. You can see all this, these different kind of surfaces here. There's a hill with these little pieces of slate-like stuff and there's this dirt and there's, a, there's rocks and it's, it's a yard that is, uh, has got as much terrain replicated as closely as possible to uh, actual Mars. So you can take these things out and drive them and see when they get stuck and uh, just see how they work as closely to really Mars as possible. Another picture of these. Uh, on the right, that's uh, the Curiosity 2012 model. And there were two of them. Uh, one was Chewy and one was Marvin. And if you've been hanging out at the Science Museum for the last 10 or 15 years, these guys have been at the Science Museum for Astronomy Days uh, a couple of times over the years. And the Mars Exploration Rover was the, uh, the second generation, the little golf cart size things. And you see those things that look like wings going off to the side, those are solar panels. And the new one, Perseverance, does not have that because again, it's nuclear power. Uh, comparing MSL, Curiosity on the left and Mars 2020 on the right, you can see how they're almost identical looking, hard to tell the difference. And this is at the museum about 10 years ago, that's either Marvin or Chewy and me there on the left for scale. Um, you see how big it is. It's uh, perseverance and curiosity are about the size of a small car. And again, on the far right, on the opposite side for me, is the nuclear power source. Wow. And Alan, um, why did they, why, why are these rovers getting bigger instead of smaller? So it seems like being smaller would make it easier to send to Mars, right? But they're getting bigger instead. It is. In fact, you really don't want to make anything bigger than it has to be. But you just kind of get carried away with science and you think, well, th there's so many more instruments and so much you want to do that it just gets bigger. And then when it gets bigger, it needs more power. So you need a bigger power supply. Then you get all that and you need a bigger rocket just to get it there. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, it's keep, just keeps getting bigger and heavier because you just can't help yourself. You want to put more science, scientific instruments on it. And one of the reasons why it's going to collect these samples for bringing back is the science instruments on here are just miniaturized versions of what would be in a real laboratory on Earth. And we would really like to get some of Mars back to a real laboratory on Earth where you've got car-sized instruments that do a better job of analyzing this stuff than just these little miniaturized ones. Mm -hmm. um, this is just kind of an exploded picture of some of that stuff, um, all the different instruments for analyzing Mars and its environment. It's kind of an international effort. You can see some different flags of uh, different countries that have uh, contributed a lot of the significant parts here. And, and this is a kind of a cartoon drawing to show the different parts, but this really illustrates the, uh, you know, like if anybody was out yesterday in the snow, it's like the advantage if you've got four wheel drive. Well, these are six wheel drive because Mars is a really fine sand most of the place. You don't want to get, to get stuck, like you didn't want to get stuck going out driving yesterday. But this suspension, it's six wheel drive, it's six electric drive, fully electric, and uh, no gasoline. <laughs> and it's got fully independent suspension and you can see how the tires are attached together here and even the suspension goes up on top of the back of the robot. Um, this is called a rocker bogey suspension. And I really made a fool of myself once in a presentation. I got my tongue tied and called it a rookie booger suspension. And well, everybody laughed and mm, made me look bad and I got yelled at. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's such a fun name, right? More fun. Yeah, rocker, bo <laughs> rocker boogie suspension, even the real name is kind of fun. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is on the head, that's one of the cameras. And this is another one of the cameras. And that's the head with the two cam, well, two of the like, what, two, four, five cameras that are on the head. And here's one of the collection tubes. 
Uh, this was one of the early prototype collection tubes I took a picture of three or four years ago uh, when they were just designing these things. Um, and this is the real ones being installed on the underside, uh, on the top of the picture is the, uh, the rover, which is in, tucked inside the vehicle that's going to take it to Mars. And they're like working on a car that's up on a lift here, uh, installing these um, uh, sample tubes. They're gold here, they're cadmium gold in this, the final versions are. And it looks like on the right under that guy, it's like looks like a car's oil pan. And I always say, okay, it holds five quarts of 10W40 oil. And it doesn't. That's, that thing is not really an oil pan and the rover doesn't need any oil. That is the cover for the helicopter. Mm -hmm. I'll show you some more about that in a minute. And Alan, really quick, sorry, we've got a few questions. Um, one, you showed us a diagram that included metal that was yellow. And Marcel wanted to know why, what is that yellow metal? I think it was back maybe three slides. Yeah, if you look at uh, most pictures of spacecraft, it's, it looks like gold foil. If it's not gold foil, it's a gold plating. And gold is a really good reflector of radiation. So it, it, the gold coloration helps protect things uh, that's covered with it from uh, the nasty radiation environment of space. Gotcha, thank so, you. And then um, why do they need masks, goggles, and suits? Is it a toxic environment? No, I'll tell you about that in a second. Okay. <laughs> that's a good question, yes. You, you dress like that when you, uh, you build spacecraft. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> this is a helicopter, artist conception of the helicopter. It's got carbon fiber blades. It's uh, solar powered. It's going to fly around on Mars. It was really hard to design this because Mars has a lot less gravity than the Earth and the atmosphere of Mars is a lot thinner than the Earth. So it was a challenge. It's got like all these rotors and it's uh, it was a real challenge to make a robot that would fly in that kind of conditions. And well, hope it does. Uh, this is, it's called Ingenuity. Here's a picture of the robot again, being built by another guy in a funny suit. And there it is, the robot tucked on the underside of the, uh, the helicopter, tucked on the underside of the robot. And here's, I'm gonna get to that picture about people, why people dress like that. This is the power source in, uh, from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Labs, the RTG, radioisotope thermoelectric generator. You might also see it called MMRTG. And the way this works is it's a chunk of plutonium-238. It's super simple. It, there's a chunk of plutonium-238 radioactive, and it literally glows red for decades. It's hot, really hot. And there's thermocouples that change the uh, heat directly into electricity, just nonstop for many, many years. Um, and there's tubes that go around it that circulate uh, what's really antifreeze, the same kind of stuff you've got in your car, to heat the fluid. It heats the antifreeze fluid, and then those tubes of the hot fluid go wrap around certain parts inside the robot that need to stay warm. So uh, the, the uh, nuclear power source does two things. It makes electricity, and it makes uh, heated liquid to heat up Innards, innards parts of the robot. Mm -hmm. Sufficient. And here's an infrared picture of the power source. And you can see the, the, the hot on the far right is the scale. So it's like at the core where the chunk of plutonium is, it's 284 degrees Fahrenheit. And it, it stays that way for a long time. So it's, you don't have to have uh, mice running on treadmills or <laughs> solar power or anything, or wind or anything, just this hot thing. Okay, launching from Florida on an Atlas 541 rocket. This is uh, Curiosity, the previous one. No, it's New Horizons, the one that flew past Pluto. This is a common rocket. We used to launch all kinds of stuff from Florida. And this is Curiosity uh, on its way to the launch pad years ago in Florida. And this is Perseverance on the pad. And there's me, the nerd, shown standing next to it for scale. I am an exceptionally large nerd. And that, that gives you a, a size uh, perspective here. Okay, how you get to Mars. This is rocket science 101. I can tell you how to go from one planet to another in about 30 seconds. Here's how it works. You get your spacecraft into 
the rocket gets it into Earth orbit. Earth orbit is 17,500 miles an hour. Okay, you want to leave the Earth and go to Mars, right? Or go to another planet, anywhere you want to go. You have to break free of the gravitational influence of Earth, completely break free of that. So where you're not in some kind of a big lopsided orbit around Earth and you're never going to go anywhere besides Earth, you got to completely free yourself from Earth. And to do that, you got to go like 22,500 miles an hour. And then you're free from Earth and you'll never come back unless it's by accident or unless you fire a rocket and point yourself back here, you won't come back. But you're still in orbit around the sun, just like Mars is. So if you want to leave the solar system, and we've done that with New Horizons and the Voyager spacecraft, and if you want to leave the, the solar system completely, you go up to 44,000, something like 44,000 miles an hour, and that's the escape velocity from the sun. And that's going to point you out of the solar system and you'll leave and you won't come back. So, but you don't want to do that if you want to go to Mars. You want to go fast enough to leave the Earth, but not fast enough to leave the sun. So you put yourself in sun orbit and that's called the Hohmann transfer orbit after named after Walter Hohmann, the guy that invented it. And so your spacecraft is orbiting the sun and so is Mars. So you time everything just right so that your orbit around the sun crosses over Mars orbit, hopefully when Mars is right there at the same time, and then you can land. So that's simple. That's how we do it. The Hohmann transfer orbit. Okay, now landing on Mars, once you get there, spirit and opportunity before, they came in, they entered just like things enter the atmosphere here, like a meteor, you get hot and flames and you slow down, then a parachute pops open to slow you down even further. But spirit and opportunity, right at the end, the parachute couldn't slow them down fast enough because there's not much wind on Mars. I mean, not, not much atmosphere. The atmospheric density is really low. So the, uh, the parachutes can't slow them down fast enough. They would crash. So they exploded these airbags around themselves. And this is, this is what it was right here in this picture. You can see compared to the size of these other two guys over here. Inside the middle of all those airbags, that exploded just like a car airbag when you crash into something with your car, all these airbags surrounded the robots and then bounced. It landed on Mars and they bounced and bounced and bounced. And when they, they came to a stop, they deflated the airbags and the robots drove off. That's crazy. Not nearly as crazy as how we're doing it now. But so here's a couple of scientists in there testing uh, the airbags. They would get up on top of this ladder and jump onto them and go, wee! And then the other guy, you do it, you do it. So the other guy would get up there and jump on the wee, and he'd jump off, and it's you know better than a ball pit at McDonald's. So this is how, that's how we test. Yeah, that's right. That's how we test airbags. <laughs> and here's an artist's conception of these airbags landing the robot spirit and opportunity on Mars. It's they bounce, they bounce a lot of times, and finally come to rest. That seems scary. It seems like it would damage something or. But if you hit a, a, a couple of rocks, it's, it's a little dangerous because if you hit a couple of sharp rocks and you deflated a couple of these, that could be bad news. Yeah, so Alan, you might be getting into more detail about this, but um, Lenny wanted to know what, how, what do you do if something breaks? There's nothing you can do. I mean, that's one of the bad things about uh, space flight. Well, there's a couple of things you can do. Well, not in the design phase, you really want to design things so that just the breakage of one part is not going to ruin your mission. And you have to like take redundant parts of uh, jobs. Like we had a spacecraft that flew uh, through the tail of a comet once and it has several cameras. And one of its cameras was supposed to take a picture of the tail of a comet as it flew through. Well, that camera died right before it got to the comet and it just was broken, couldn't fix it. But spacecraft have other cameras. There's a navigation camera, like spacecraft in deep space, they navigate by star fields, just like the old, um, well, maybe not old, maybe they still do it. If you're out on a ship on the ocean, you figure out where you are based on the position that you're looking up with, or they have those, what do they call them, sextants or whatever. You, you look at the star field and you can tell which, where you are and which way you're going. Well, our spacecraft do that too with a camera. They point a camera at, at the star field and they figure out where they are. And uh, 
and which direction they're going. I had no idea. Yeah. So anyway, this mission, uh, talk about duplicating things so that if one part breaks, your mission's not trashed. The, this, the spacecraft that was a, a camera dive that was supposed to take a picture of the um, comet, well, it used its navigation camera instead. It just moved that around and, and it's just another story for another time. But the, the spacecraft used artificial intelligence. It decided to do that itself. It just said, well, I've, this camera's broken, so I'm going to take my navigation camera and point that at the comet and use that, which is another cool story. Wow. But you, you want to make things, but in space, back kind of to finish up the answer to your question, space is um, maintenance impossible, repair impossible. We don't have astronauts on Mars and almost everything. The Hubble Space Telescope is a rare example of when you could send something went wrong you could send up astronauts in a space shuttle and they could do a spacewalk and fix it. Mm -hmm. But almost 99.9% .9 of the time, if something goes wrong with your robot or your spacecraft or your rocket in space, if you don't have a backup system built on it, it's bad news. Mm -hmm. And then if the robot, you know, if it breaks completely, what happens to it afterwards? Do, are well, they going to pick it, it up like, on the next like, mission? Or? Well, Spirit got stuck in the mud and Opportunity got too much Mars dirt on its solar panels and couldn't power itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, Spirit and Opportunity, um, they were only supposed to last 90 days. And one of them went eight years and one of them went 14 years, wow. which is amazing. Only designed to work for 90 days. And then when you get, and this, that's a whole nother set of problems. When you only got a robot and you're trying to engineer it and design it to where it'll work for 90 days, and you don't think about, well, what if this thing goes for years? You don't think about parts lasting that long. So like during those years, um, there are parts that failed and there always are parts that fail in space because of the radiation environment and the dust on Mars getting into things and grinding them up. And um, so the longer you last beyond your design period, the more things happen that you didn't even plan for. But with spirit and opportunity, we got really lucky that could get eight and 14 years out of two robots that were only supposed to go 90 days. And that was just luck. And they were a little bit over-designed, but yeah, when things fail, you get stuck in the mud, you're stuck. If mm -hmm. you have your uh, drive motors, your engines to drive that go bad, or you don't have enough power, uh, that's just too bad. That's the end of your mission. Hope you got your science in before it dies. <laughs> wow. Well, th thanks for answering those questions, Alan. I'll let you move on. Um, okay. We'll get some more later. <laughs> All right, this is how we're doing it now though. No more airbags because, you know, you were talking about our robots keep getting bigger and bigger. Well, airbag things for curiosity and perseverance won't work. They're just too big and too heavy. So this is the wildest and craziest thing NASA has ever done. And it's called the seven minutes of terror. If you go Google that and watch that on YouTube, you know why we call it the seven minutes of terror. And there's a sky crane maneuver where there's a robot powered rocket that has the real robot uh, perseverance hanging underneath it by bungee cords. And this robot powered rocket flies around Mars with full artificial intelligence and no help from humans anywhere. It flies around and it's spooky looking too on top of everything. It flies around on Mars and looks for a, a place that it thinks would be a good place to drop perseverance. And then when it finds something, it lowers it and then disconnects the bungee cords and flies away. And this is a, this is kind of an, uh, an artist's um, conception of the whole seven minutes of terror happening here. Uh, starting at the top left, you come in, they didn't have the heat and stuff. You come into the atmosphere and you get slowed down like a meteor coming into the Earth's atmosphere or our astronauts returning slow down a lot of speed, parachutes open up, and then when the parachutes have done all they can do, then the sky crane. Down in the bottom right, this spooky looking thing, which I have even spookier looking pictures of here in just a second. But this is the seven minutes of terror, and this is on February 18th, what we'll be showing you on the live program, the live landing event when Perseverance lands on the 18th. We'll be showing you this live. Okay, entry, it's called EDL, Entry, Descent, and Landing. You arrive at Mars going 12,100 miles an hour. And then seven minutes later, you have to be at zero miles an hour on the ground. It won't help much if you are arrive at the ground when you're still going a couple hundred miles an hour. That would not be good. 
And this where, is. Hmm? Oh, sorry. So uh, Melissa wanted to know real quick, where does the sky crane go after it's you know done its job? Oh, funny story. It flies off and crashes. Well, uh, hoping, like on Mars though, right? Crashes yeah, yeah. Mars. Okay. Uh, it flies away as far as it can fly and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully further than where the robot would ever want to rove and crashes and it explodes because there's going to be some rocket fuel left on it. And um, my friend at JPL who did these animations, the first animation he made, he showed that. He showed the sky crane flying off, just real creepy and spooky like, and it crashed and exploded. Well, they made him take that out because that was, um, uh, you know, you just don't want to show that. You know, us deliberately crashing and exploding things. So uh, the versions that you'll see, if you go to YouTube or NASA's website and look that, don't have that. They just show it disconnecting and flying just a little bit off. I've got the original on this computer, but oh I can't. I can't show you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Classified. I'm not allowed to show you that. Hmm. <laughs> but but on February 18th, we'll see the real thing, correct? You won't see it with live. We won't see it. We'll get it. Just the, okay. just the animation that has that part. In oh, it. yeah, they'll release the animation then, right? Right. Well, animation's already been released. Yeah, you can, oh, get, okay. you can get that now gotcha. from APL's website. And if I could figure out how to play videos on this presentation, I'd show it to you right now, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, do you know how long um, it takes, like how long the sky crane hovers when it's lowering the rover? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer. It would be fuel limited. Uh, yeah. It only has so much fuel to hover around and look, but it knows because it's full AI. It knows that if it's got uh, sort of like Neil Armstrong in the moon landing, it knows that, well, I better find some place within the next 30 seconds mm -hmm. and then it'll make a decision. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, thanks, Alan. Okay, uh, so this is in uh, Pasadena up the hill from Los Angeles, a uh, planetary landing test bed. I just think, you know, you walk through the woods and you see this <laughs> planetary landing test bed. It's pretty cool. It's where we test landing things. And inside, this is the sky crane. Inside the vehicle uh, assembly facility, spacecraft assembly facility, um, this is the sky crane, the creepy looking robotic thing that up underneath it is where Perseverance is tucked. And you can see the guy there in the white suit that for scale, how big it is. And the orange thing in the middle is one of the fuel tanks. And the little uh, red cone shaped things at the bottom, those are the rocket nozzles. Again, you see the rocket nozzles, little kind of reddish orange things. And there's some, a lot of that more uh, gold colored stuff that uh, uh, one of the viewers was asking about. The mm -hmm. test radiation. And this is, the, this is the sky crane being tested in the assembly room. Um, and it's got, I don't know if you can see, but it's got the bungee cords coming down from it that are, attach it to the robot and the little orange rocket engines. So this whole thing, just like this, will just fly around Mars and uh, try to find a good place to disconnect the bungee cords and set that guy down. And if anybody wants to read more about this, JPL scientist who is actually the lead technical director of the Perseverance program, Dr. Adam Steltzner, wrote a book called The Right Kind of Crazy. And that was about developing, how he developed uh, this system of landing. And it's only been done once before for curiosity. Um, and we're doing it again on February 18th. <laughs> and does the, um, the sky crane also use um, nuclear, is it nuclear powered as well? Or does it have a different kind of fuel? No, it's got, uh, it's got just got rocket fuel and okay. batteries. Because it, it, it's life, it doesn't have to uh, last that long. It doesn't have, it's, it's operational period is just a few minutes. So uh, it doesn't have to have nuclear power or solar power. You can put all the power it needs in a battery, mm -hmm. plus the rocket fuel. And this is what, this is right after the robot, you're looking up underneath. This is right after the robot got installed on the underside of the sky crane. That's how it's flying to Mars right now. The robot is, is installed under the sky crane. Um, the, you can see just some paper taped around the wheels of the robot, the orange rocket nozzles. And on the bottom center, you can see the helicopter there that's not got its cover over it yet. And this is another picture of the sky crane from above. They're covering the fuel tanks with some aluminum colored uh, insulation this time. 
And here's an artist's conception of this is what it would look like if you were on the ground looking up and you saw the sky crane uh, trying to look for a place to land Perseverance. Another picture of that. And this is right at touchdown. The bungee cords are still attached. It uh, explosive bolts release the bungee cords and then the uh, creepy looking thing flies off and crashes. And this is where we'll be broadcasting from on February 18th. This is the room at NASA's Mission Control. And there's a, a nerd, me, there to show you the scale of how big this room is. Uh, mark your calendars. This is where, this is the control room where these events happen. And if you saw the last one, um, kind of funny, there's, a, I don't know, there's any jars of peanuts. It's a real nervous seven minutes. There's a, there's a time lag between when it's really happening and when we get the signals and the pictures of like, you know, at least seven minutes. And so what's really happening, the sky crane and the landing and everything happens seven minutes before we know whether it even worked or not, before we get signals and pictures. And behind me, oh booger. Um, <laughs> and that's the seven minutes of terror, right? Is waiting to know whether it was a successful landing yeah, so everybody in this room, their blood pressure's going up, they're real nervous, they're waiting on a TDC, touch, TDN, touchdown nominal, somebody's watching the screen, says touchdown nominal, and, uh, and that means that they've got the signal that it's on the ground safely. But during that seven minutes of terror and during other events, yeah, okay, good. During other events that um, uh, NASA does, these nervous events, uh, waiting for something to land. There's uh, jars of dry roasted peanuts. It's kind of a tradition that all the people sitting in this room are munching dry roasted peanuts to kind of, it's, it's a tradition. And uh, pacing back and forth nervously and having mm -hmm. fun. But um, if you can see behind, am I, am I in the picture here? You are, but um, so since you are sharing your, is it okay if I stop sharing your screen so that you're sure. bigger on screen? Yeah. I want to show you this, uh, what's behind me here. This is this, um, this is the screen from our deep space network that we'll be watching. NASA has at uh, three places around the earth, 120 degrees apart, sets of radio dishes for communicating with spacecraft. And because they're, they're in Spain, Australia, and in the Mojave Desert near LA, in, halfway between LA and Las Vegas. And the reason for that is Wherever there's a spacecraft out there, if you want to talk to it, there's, and wherever the Earth is and rotating, you'll always have a set of dishes pointing at any place in space that you need to be pointed at. Um, so up here, there's three rows of them. This top one is Madrid, Spain. It's live right now. And we are actually, M20 is the Mars 2020 robot. And these are the dishes in Madrid and Goldstone between uh, LA and Las Vegas and Canberra in Australia. So up here, this is one of the dishes uh, in Madrid right now. And you see these squiggly lines? Some of them have squiggly lines going to them. That means signals are coming, coming and going from the spacecraft. And M20 is Mars 2020 on its way to Mars right now. And you see the squiggly lines. That means we are communicating with the robot right now um, as it's flying towards Mars. Um, and that's why that will disappear during the EDL, during the seven minutes of terror. And once it's on the ground, you'll get your squiggly lines back. It's there, it's safe, it's working, and we're communicating with it. Hi. So yeah, so we're gonna be showing that. It's, well, I'll have it right here during the landing event. Then we'll have mission control. And, and we've have, had a lot of questions in the chat about that February 18th event. So um, we're going to send a link to the calendar event to all the registrants for Astronomy Days. So um, we don't yet know the title of our event besides Perseverance Landing, um, but it should start around 1 p.m. and we'll have you know the educational stuff. We'll have Alan here, he's an awesome speaker. And then um, the landing should be around 2.20, right? Is that correct? Close, okay. yeah. yeah. okay. We don't know. Just so y'all know, you don't have to ask us more questions. We'll send you all the information through email. We don't know exactly to the minute when the landing is because when you've got spacecraft going through space, you have to make tiny little corrections uh, called TD T TCMs, tra trajectory correction maneuvers. It's because uh, space flight starts out like, uh, I always give this analogy, starts out like football 
where the quarterback, when he throws the ball, he throws the, he can't throw the ball to where the receiver is when he throws it. He has to throw the ball to where the receiver is going to be when the ball comes down. And that's like rocking the, uh, launching the rocket towards a moving planet. But on the way there, I mean, unfortunately, and football quarterbacks can't do this, but on the way there, if the football is not quite going to where the receiver is going, we have rockets and we can do TCMs, trajectory correction maneuvers. And we continuously do those as the tra trajectory needs to be fine-tuned to hit the target. Um, so then it becomes like golf and you're at the end, like you're, well, I need to hit this a little bit to the left to get in the hole. So because of all these little rocket firings and things, you don't know until fairly soon before the landing to the second when it's gonna land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nerve wracking. Oh, yeah. um, and what happens yeah. to the rocket after it drops off, you know, the sky crane and, and the rover? Does it turn around, go back to Earth? Uh, there is no rocket. Uh, well, there's only a small cruise stage okay. and, and it just gets, it doesn't re-enter. And what you want to do when you disconnect your uh, landing spacecraft for your rover, you want to fire a little rocket to make them go a little bit in different directions because it would be really embarrassing if you landed your a robot on Mars and then the rocket that got it there came right in and, oh, no. and, and you know, landed right on top of it. That would be embarrassing. So you <laughs> make sure that, and you make sure that your rocket goes a different direction from where your robot's going. Mm -hmm. Very important. Um, yeah. So Alan, we've got about 10 minutes left in the program. Do, do you want to share more slides or are you okay if we answer some questions? Because we've had some really good ones. Yeah, uh, can we zip through a uh, real quick and I'll-, sure, I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll let you know if we get too close to time. Do I need to put it back? You do, yes, sorry, oh. share screen again. And I did have that other uh, question about the, I'm gonna get through this real quick. There you go, yeah, looks great. Well, I'm not gonna get through this real quick because, <laughs> oops. Okay, uh, good time for questions. <laughs> My presentation <laughs> well, is- Well, uh, off the top of your head, do you know how long it takes to get uh, to Mars from Earth? Yes, uh, that Hohmann transfer orbit thing, mm -hmm. it's, um, oh, might as well unshare me here. Uh, Maybe if you click on this the slide, I wonder if it's just- I can't even force quit that. Oh yeah, here we go, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that Hohmann transfer orbit, it takes um, about eight to nine months, seven, eight, nine months in there um, to do that. Um, and that's just because of the speeds. Like it, it's always, everything you send to Mars is always going to take around eight months, give or take a little bit because of the speed. Remember I was telling you, you got to go so fast to escape Earth, but if you go any faster than that, you'll actually leave solar orbit and zing past Mars. And also when you get someplace, you have to do another planet, you have to slow down. And the faster you're going, the more rocket fuel you're gonna to have to use to slow down. That's mm -hmm. the, like the New Horizon mission that flew past uh, Pluto. Uh, people are like, why didn't you just stop and go into orbit instead of just fly right past Pluto? Well, you needed a, it was going 40 something thousand miles an hour and it would have needed a huge rocket to slow down to go into orbit around Pluto. So it would have just taken too much rocket to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I get this back. Um, so let's see. Marcel asked a while ago, um, why not make the rover return to Earth so that it can be used for more than just the eight to 16 years? Just a um, long time. But. Good question. Yeah, you'd have to launch it from the ground and that, requ that would require a, a big launch vehicle. Mm -hmm. and a big rocket to get it back to Earth. You'd do the same home and trans, uh, transfer orbit in reverse, but you would still have to get a rocket there big enough to, and, and the weight of a rocket, if you wanted to do that, to put a rocket on board, it would mean that the rocket that you launched from Earth with would have to include that return rocket. So the Earth rocket would have to be much, much bigger. So you start getting into this uh, snowballing, well, this has got to be bigger. Well, then this has got to be bigger. Well, then this has got to be bigger. And then you get too big and expensive. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, is there a way for the robot to secure themselves down to the surface in case of extreme weather, like a dust storm or a tornado? 
Um, or someone, yeah, Lenny mentioned Mars quakes, you know, things that might damage it. Can it strap itself in or down? Uh, kind of? No, not really, but there's not a lot of gravity there. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, they're kind of squat. They're sort of uh, low center of gravity. So no, it doesn't have any little hooks or anything that it can uh, stick itself in the ground with. Mm -hmm. And why don't we just protect it with clear plastic, you know, like a giant rubber made or something around the rover. I guess I wouldn't be able to study uh, Mars then, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, you want to try to keep it simple too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good question. Mm. Okay, any more questions? All right. um, are we able to see the camera shots when they're taken from Mars at Earth? And can they operate the direction of the robot from Earth? Like, you know, can they kind of have like a joystick or be writing computer code, you know, to operate its movements in real time. Good. Um, yeah, no. and there's a second part to that question too, but huh? go ahead. Uh, no, because the, uh, that's why our spacecraft that are very further than the moon have to have artificial intelligence to be able to figure stuff out. You can't joystick control something where the signal that goes back and forth to the spacecraft is at light speed. And if Mars is seven light minutes away, that means the round trip is, uh, you know, seven minutes, mm -hmm. uh, 15 minutes, 14 or 15 minutes. So that's why these uh, uh, things have to be um, artificial intelligence to be able to, um, um, to deal with those kind of changes in um, the, the, the distance it takes to... Mm -hmm. So there's another. But once it's landed, they can't really control its movement at all, or can they at least, you no, know, you tell, it it, what, tell it what to do once a day, like you know, go once there, day. analyze that, do this, and then hope they don't always do what you tell them to do, but uh, <laughs> uh, you hope they do. Yeah, you know, maybe right. back here. No. Um, and so, how do we get a signal that far away to communicate with the robot? You know, like literally, how do we communicate when it's like you said, uh, about 10, 10 months away. Yeah, it's, uh, well, yeah, 10 minutes away. Yeah, it's through the deep space network, these really big dishes. Um, the satellite? Uh, yeah, they've got uh, radio, it's just uh, radio communication mm -hmm. back and forth. And we're still doing that with the Voyagers that are, um, uh, you know, beyond the um, solar system now. Mm -hmm. Can you do things like, um, you know, update the software or upgrade it at all once, you know, it's on yes, Mars? Absolutely. You can send uh, a fresh software. Um, and it's done all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there was a cool story about how one of the robots um, uh, refused to do something once and we had to send it a software upgrade that had a, a because of its intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, we had to send it a uh, software upgrade that had a problem so that it would see that problem and it tricked it into doing the right thing. That's great. Um, uh, let me, uh, I remember this uh, other question about uh, why do you wear space suits? I mean, uh, bunny suits like that? Mm -hmm. um, because we're looking for life on Mars, right? And we don't want to be confused by like, you know, these guys in the, when the spacesuits, it, what if a, a booger fell out of their nose on this on the robot? And then when your robot's on Mars, it says, it zooms in and, oh, look, there's a booger. You know, that's proof that there's life on Mars. And and then there'd be on the headlines that, yeah, we robot found life on Mars. And the only thing we know about it right now is it has a nose. And, <laughs> and you know, you don't want that to happen. You want, and you don't want to contaminate Mars with, earth bacteria either um, so that I mean you could contaminate it with some bacteria that might actually live there and then in a future mission you find it and you don't want to think uh, well where'd that come from somebody's nose in the assembly room or is that a Martian bacteria and if Mars actually does have life on it now it could be uh, pathogenic to them it could hurt them so we try to keep all of our spacecraft that are going to other planets as um, completely clean and sterile as possible for that reason. Mm -hmm. All right, so I know that a lot of people have to go right now, but Alan, are you ready to show something else or do you wanna do a couple more questions before uh, we say goodbye? 
I, well, I'm still trying to recover this. So okay. uh, if, if there's more questions, yeah, we can do that. Um, I think I may be back here. Okay, yeah, I'll let you um, get back to the slides and we can go for um, a couple more minutes and then we'll have to wrap up. Okay, um, you see my guy standing here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a dummy. Real person? No, no, it's not a real person. <laughs> this is from the observation deck when you wanna watch spacecraft being built and when nobody's in there, uh, they put this mannequin, they dress him up and they have him saying something like hello or something. Uh, this is just the assembly room in uh, Pasadena where spacecraft are built. Um, da, 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 da. It's a, not a very good place to take pictures because it's so brightly lit and so clean. And this is the United States Olympic fencing team doing a selfie with the robot. No, I'm not, I'm kidding. Those are our nerds. Those are not fencers. And I already answered this question. Why do you dress like this if your job is building robots? Um, there's curiosity again. I mean, perseverance. Um, and uh, this is a cool story about the evolution of Mars robot wheels. On the top left is the original wheel that was supposed to be uh, sent to Mars on curiosity. It was banned because NASA officials said, well, we don't want you stamping JPL all over Mars. Um, so that one is in the Mars yard in Pasadena right now. And the one on the bottom center is one of the real ones that's on Mars. And um, those holes uh, actually spell JPL and Morse code. So nah, 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 nah. we're stamping <laughs> JPL all over Mars. <laughs> that's, yeah. um, and the one on the top right is the uh, uh, Perseverance wheel. It's just an evolution in design. And after being told don't put holes or JPL or anything on the wheels this time, <laughs> yeah, and uh, the scientist that told me that, I said, did, did somebody get yelled at for doing that? And he goes, yeah, they got hollered at. And he was from the South, and I think being hollered at is worse than being yelled at. Mm -hmm. so, mm. right. so here's the Mars Yard uh, terrain testing. Here's one of the little dummy uh, rocker bogey, rooker bogey suspensions. Uh, and there's Maggie. This is the exact duplicate of Curiosity. Maggie is an acronym for Mars Automated Giant Gizmo for integrated engineering. And how do you train a robot that has artificial intelligence? Do what you want. You get a cattle prod or a stick and you poke it when it misbehaves, like this guy on the left is doing. He's not doing that. If that were true and it's not, then you know. <laughs> Deep Space Network. This is the dish in the Mojave and that's, uh, that's me, the nerd with for size comparison. Uh, this is how, where we talk to them from uh, here. And that's the, the dish, the size of the dish compared to the Cinderella Castle at Disney World. Mission Control in Pasadena. There we go. Okay, questions. Oh, that was so cool to see all the behind the scenes um, photos, you know, of the lab and everything. What was that guy doing with the, you know, the long god? When I said he was poking the misbehaving robot? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have no idea what he was doing. Oh. <laughs> Very cool. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, we are going to say goodbye now because we have a long, big day full of other Astronomy Days programs. There are some questions we didn't get to. So um, our staff behind the scenes have sent you um, our email addresses. You can always email us with, with questions um, and we can you know, contact Alan. Please join us again February 18th uh, for that Perseverance landing. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you NC Space Grant for sponsoring Astronomy Days and to our Friends of the Museum members who help support us every single day. And thank you of course to Alan because Alan, you're great. A wonderful presenter, we love having you here. <laughs> thank um, you for coming. Yeah, and of course, if you want to grab your astronomy gear, we've got t-shirts and hoodies on the website. Friends members save 10%. So, uh, yep, we're, we're putting links in the chat to a survey. You can um, evaluate all the programs for Astronomy Days. Um, leave your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And we're also leaving some links where you can find the rest of the Astronomy Days programs. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. And thank you, Alan. Thank you. Bye. Bye.